Good morning. And welcome to St. James Lutheran Church. I am Pastor Christian Marquardt. Very glad to have the opportunity to worship with all of you here today. Uh, today is the second Sunday after Pentecost. This is a season where God continues to give us instruction from his word on uh, what it means to be a believer and how we ought to live our lives. Today is also the first Sunday in a three-week series looking at our um, God's calling different people into the ministry and to see uh, how he did that for them and what that might mean for us as well. We'll begin our worship with our opening hymn. That's hymn number 633, Speak, O Lord. You'll find that near the back of the blue hymnal. The words are also displayed on the screen. May God bless our worship this morning. Amen. Our worship continues this morning as we use the service setting one. You'll find that on page 154 in the front of the blue hymnal. The words are also displayed on the screen. Please stand. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Let us confess our sins to the Lord. Holy God, gracious Father, I am sinful by nature and have sinned against you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have not loved you with my whole heart. 
I have not loved others as I should. I deserve your punishment both now and forever. But Jesus, my Savior, paid for my sins with his innocent suffering and death. Trusting in him, I pray, God have mercy on me, a sinner. Our gracious Father in heaven has been merciful to us. He sent his only Son, Jesus Christ, who gave his life as the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord for the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord for this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O God, the strength of all who trust in you, mercifully hear our prayers. Be gracious to us in our weakness, and give us strength to keep your commandments in all we say and do. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. Our first scripture reading this morning comes from the book of Exodus, chapter 3. As this is also our sermon text, I won't uh, go into, anyth into everything too in-depth right now, but this is Moses' call into ministry. The call into ministry is not so great and important because Moses is especially qualified or wise or gifted, but the call into ministry is good because God is the one who is calling Moses into it. A reading from Exodus, chapter 3, beginning at verse 1. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the far side of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight, 
why the bush does not burn up. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses, and Moses said, here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I've heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I'm concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? God said, I will be with you. And this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. Moses said to God, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, what is his name? Then what shall I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, the name by which I am to be remembered from generation to generation. The word of the Lord. Our second scripture reading this morning comes from Paul's first letter to Timothy, chapter 1. In these verses, we'll hear Paul talk about his own calling into ministry, saying that when he was brought into ministry, it was not because he was so good, so wise, so talented, so understanding. In fact, the Lord showed him mercy. And because the Lord showed him mercy, because Paul understood what mercy really was, it really equipped him all the more to be a servant for God. A reading from 1 Timothy chapter 1, beginning at verse 12. I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who has given me strength, that he considered me faithful, appointing me to his service. Even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly, along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason, I was shown mercy, so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his unlimited patience as an example for those who would believe on him and receive eternal life. Now to the king eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. The word of the Lord. Our worship continues as we join in singing the gospel acclamation together. You'll find that on page 161. If you're following along in the hymnal, please note that we will sing the gospel acclamation for God's word. Please stand. Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. Your words are my joy and my heart's delight. Alleluia, Alleluia. The Gospel reading for the second Sunday after Pentecost comes from Matthew chapter 9. The reading begins at verse 9. As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told him, and Matthew got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners 
came and ate with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. The Gospel of the Lord. You may be seated. Our worship continues as we join in singing our hymn of the day. It's hymn number 578, Chief of Sinners Though I Be. You'll find that near the back of the blue hymnal. The words are also on the screen. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? As I said uh, earlier, this is the first in a three-week series looking at God's calling different people into the ministry. And so today we're going to hear about God, God calling Moses into ministry, God sending Moses into ministry. And the main point that Moses needed to learn is it doesn't matter so much who you are or what you've done or even in a sense what your gifts or talents are, but the fact that God's sending you means it's time to go. And if God said that to Moses, then I suppose God could say that to us in particular ways and in general ways as well. So we're going to spend three weeks trying to figure out what it means when God sends somebody into ministry, and today we're going to be looking at Moses. And when we find Moses, 
we do not find him where we would expect him. Because in general, we know about Moses. Moses was in Egypt. Moses was talking to somebody named Pharaoh, who was the ruler of the Egyptians. Moses was trying to get his people out of Egypt. And yet, when we find Moses here, he's not in Egypt. He's in a different place altogether. He's in a place called Midian. And he's sort of wandering around. At least that's how it appears to us. And if we wanted to know how Moses got there, we'd have to remember Moses was born during a time when Pharaoh, the leader of the Egyptians, was trying to get rid of all the Israelites. He said, there's too many of them here. Sooner or later, they're going to throw off our rule. They're going to take over and they're going to be in charge. So he started having all of the young baby boys who were born killed. Moses was kept alive because his parents hid him. And eventually they said, this baby's too big. We can't hide him anymore. We got to let him go. Pharaoh's daughter the daughter of the ruler of the Egyptians, finds him in a basket. She raises him as her own. He grows up in the palace. He learns the language. He becomes um, learned in things about the Egyptians. He knows the things about his own people. He lives among them. And one day, he sees an Egyptian beating one of his own people, beating one of the Israelites. And Moses steps in, and he kills the Egyptian, and tries to bury him in the sand and hopes nobody knows about it, but people found out. Moses, depending on the way you look at it, if you might call it justified, but I would say, no, he murdered that man. And fearing for his life, Moses ran away. And he settled in a land called Midian. And he met this guy, Jethro. Jethro here is his father-in-law, which means Moses married Jethro's daughter. And he had a couple kids. And he had been living in Midian for about 40 years. For 40 years, he wandered in the wilderness, sort of wandering, watching sheep, tending flocks, just sort of chilling out. And now God appears to him from within a burning bush, a bush that's on fire, it's burning, but it doesn't burn up. What's the only explanation? God is doing something. God is getting Moses' attention. Jethro does come up later, um, if, if you want to keep on reading about Moses' life. We're only spending this one Sunday looking at it. But if you want to keep reading about Moses' life, you'll see that Jethro comes up later on. He is sort of a father figure to Moses. His own parents aren't here, but Jethro is there, and he gives him good advice later on in his life. Moses is watching flocks. The angel of the Lord appears to him in verse 2, in flames of fire from within a bush. When we see the, that terminology, the angel of the Lord... When we see it in the Old Testament, we want to remember, first of all, angel means messenger. This is the messenger of the Lord. This is somebody that God has sent to appear to Moses. Then later on, when Moses is going to look at the bush, who is speaking? God is speaking from within the bush. And so the way we would look at this and say, there's an angel in the bush or is there God in the bush? The way that most scholars have looked at it and, and thought about it has said, Several times in the Old Testament, we hear this expression, the angel of the Lord, the messenger of the Lord appearing to somebody, but it's not just an angel. <laughs> it's not just an angel, although seeing an angel would be certainly something. It's not just an angel, it's actually God appearing. And so the way that a lot of people have looked at this is said, it's not just any angel, it's somebody in particular, it's actually the second person of the Trinity, it's Jesus before he became man appearing. So this is Moses talking to God directly. And Moses is talking to God, and Moses says, here I am. God says, don't come any closer. Who am I? I'm the God of your father, the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Good news, Moses. I know about your people. I know you're concerned about your people, and that's why you stood up for your fellow man. You shouldn't have done what you did, but you were standing up for your own people. I care about them too. And I'm going to set them free. And I'm going to bring them into a land, um, a spacious land, a good land, a fertile land. Uh, there is a complication. There are people living there already. You'll find out about that later, Moses. I'm going to set them free. Here's how I'm going to do it. I'm sending you. And Moses says, what? You're sending me? 
but who am I? And Moses liked all the stuff God said up to that point. All of it sounded really wonderful. God said, I've, I've heard about their misery, their slaves, I'm concerned about their suffering. I have come to rescue them. I'm going to bring them out of that land into a new land. There's people there. We're going to clear them out. This is going to be the land for my people. The cry has reached me. I've seen them being oppressed. So now I'm sending you to Pharaoh, to the leader of the Egyptians, to the man that you ran away from because you were afraid. I'm sending you, Moses, you're going to go and you're going to bring my people out of Egypt. Moses says, what are you talking about? How is that going to happen? And why did you pick me? I've been gone for 40 years. I've been watching sheep. Do you want me to watch some sheep? I can do that. I'm well qualified to do that. You want me to go and talk to Pharaoh and convince him to let his slaves go so that they can go somewhere else and they're going to live in a land where other powerful people are living already? The whole thing makes no sense. Moses says, who, who am I that you think I'm going to be able to do this? And God answers you know, in a way that he often answers people. This has not just happened in Exodus chapter 3. It happens throughout all of Scripture, where somebody asks a question to God, or somebody in the Gospels, someone asks a question of Jesus, and he doesn't answer the question that they asked. He answers a different question. He answers the question they should have asked. Moses says, well, who am I that I should do this? And God says, I will be with you. And he goes on from there. But that's all he really needed to say. Moses says, who am I? And God says, well, I'll be with you. So go. I want you to go and do this strange, difficult, terrifying thing. And I'll be with you. So it'll be okay. And if we would go on reading through the book of Exodus, we would find out that what God said is true. He was with Moses. It all worked out. The people did leave Egypt. Pharaoh did let them go. They did go into a land where people were already living. They did conquer them. They did have a place to stay, and they were free and safe, and God watched over them. All of that happened. But Moses is still afraid. Moses is still not sure that the Almighty all-powerful God who just appeared to him is right. He thinks perhaps God is wrong. And God could have dealt with this in several different ways. But the way that he chooses to deal with it is by reassuring Moses. Moses, you're still the guy for the job. I'm still the one who's going to be with you. Do you want to know more in depth who I am? What it means that I will be with you? I'll tell you. I'll give you what you need to know. I'll give you more than you deserve. God said, I'll be with you. This is the sign. <laughs> when you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. He says, Moses, here's the sign. I'll see you back here. It's going to be a few years, but we'll be back here on this same mountain. And it won't just be you by yourself. You won't be surrounded by a flock of sheep. You'll be with people. They'll be here. We'll all be here together. That's the sign. Then you'll know. <laughs> uh, I like that sign. Sometimes God gave people a sign, and it was a sign in advance. God says, here's the sign I'm going to give you. It's in the future. When it's done, you'll be right back here, and then you'll say, oh, God, you were right. That's a good sign. It's not too different, really, from the signs that God has promised to us. God promises, I'll be with you. I'll be with you your whole life. And one day you and I will see each other face to face. You'll be in heaven. I'll be there too. And it'll be like this Sunday morning, but it'll be a whole lot better. It'll be worship and praise and peace and comfort. And here's the sign to you. You're going to see me in heaven. We'll, we'll meet there together, and then you'll know. Same kind of thing he says to Moses. Here's the sign. I'll meet you back here. Give it a few years. Give it like 40 years. 
And Moses says, because he's not content with this, he hasn't even seen a sign yet. God says, I'll, I'll show you a sign in the future. Moses is still not happy with this. And actually, we're not even going to go through all of his complaints because he just continues over and over and over again to say, God, are you sure? Are you really sure? Did you want to pick me? Why didn't you pick my brother? He's better at talking. Are you really sure? Maybe not me. Maybe somebody else. And God over and over and over again says, yes, Moses, it is you. Now go. So Moses says to God, well, what if I go to them and I say, you know, God sent me to you, but they say, well, what's his name? Well, you know, what am I going to tell him? And I don't think Moses is asking because he's genuinely interested, although he ought to be. He's just trying to come up with some reason. Well, I don't really know your name, so you know, what am I going to tell him? God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. God says, I am the God who is eternally, that's who I am. I am the one God. I exist independently of myself. I was here before you were here, Moses. I'll be here after you're here. I am always forever. I am the one God. And the one God who exists is sending you. That's would you go and tell the people? And the Hebrew word that's here, um, the basic pronunciation is something like Yahweh, if you've heard that word before. That's why this is in all capital letters in your Bible translation. This is the proper name for God. God says, this is my name. I am the God who is. Sometimes you might have heard God described as him who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. He is the eternal God. He always is. He never was not. There's a little <laughs> fun little grammar thing to think about. This is the God who is. And he reveals himself to Moses and he says, I want you to go. And he, and he expands on it. The Lord, all capitals. When you see that in the Old Testament, that's what you ought to think. You could say, you think Yahweh, although the Hebrews would never have pronounced that. They said, we don't want to misuse God's name. If we don't pronounce God's name, we won't be misusing it. That's misguided. <laughs> it's not true. But that's the way they looked at it. And when they read through it, they wouldn't even say that word. They would say Adonai, which also means Lord. God said to Moses, say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever the name by which I am to be remembered from generation to generation. And this is quoted by Jesus later on in the Gospels. As they were trying to figure out if the resurrection was real. You know, is, is that really something that God talks about in the Old Testament? Is resurrection real or is it just an idea that people came up with? You know, do people just live and die and that's it? How can we know? And Jesus references this verse, or really many verses in the Old Testament that say this, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Jesus says, God is not the God of the dead. He is the God of the living. So if he describes himself in this way, it must be more meaningful than just saying, three old dudes who died a long time ago. He's the God of them. But they must live because he lives. He is the eternal forever living God, and that's the God who sent Moses. And that ought to be enough, but if we kept on reading, we would find out over and over again, Moses is still saying, no, God, I'm not qualified, I'm not capable, I can't do it, doesn't matter. God sent Moses. And his first thing is saying, who am I that I should do this? I ran away, I'm wanted for murder, I'm not qualified. I barely know those people. Why are you choosing me? Who am I? God's response is, I will be with you. So go. Now, in particular, when we talk about a call into ministry, we're often talking about somebody who serves on behalf of a group of people. And I don't, I have a call. It's not the same as what Moses had because Moses talked to God directly. 
He saw him face to face. And God spoke to Moses face to face and said, Moses, I want you to go. That's not the same thing that I had. I did not have that experience. I would have liked it. Although I, I'm a little concerned I would have reacted just the same way Moses did and protested. But instead, God uses all of us in ministry in, in a variety of ways. And he uses pastors in a particular way to serve God's people with his word. And he also uses all of you to serve people with his word in different ways. He uses parents to teach children. Sometimes he uses children to teach parents. Grandparents to teach grandchildren and grandchildren to remind grandparents of things and friends to remind one another of what God's word is and what it says. And he uses us for so many different purposes. God is still accomplishing so many good things. Yeah, he's not setting Israelites free from Egypt, but there are many good things that God accomplishes and he uses you to do it. And you might say, well, God, I just like the part where you said it was going to happen. You know, I like that part. I like the part where you said you were going to do it. I didn't like so much the part where you said I'm a part of it, that it relies on me. Because I'm afraid, God. I don't, I don't, don't know how I can do that. I don't, I don't want to do it. I Maybe send somebody else. That fear that Moses had is in all of us as God sends us into different capacities for ministry. And we say, God, are you sure? Are you sure it's me? Maybe somebody else, maybe the guy next over there is more qualified. Maybe that lady is, is better at doing that than me. Maybe I shouldn't be doing it. Maybe somebody else, anybody else, not me, please God. And God says, I will be with you. Who will be with you? God will be with you. Who will be with you? The Lord will be with you. The eternal, almighty, only God who exists has put you right here in this place and time. And yeah, wouldn't it be nice if we lived in a different time? What if we lived in, during the Renaissance and we could see the Sistine Chapel being painted? Wouldn't it be nice if we lived far off in the future and we had flying cars and we could communicate to people with thoughts in our head? Maybe that would be even better. No. And I say no because God put you here right now and he's brought you into this community of believers and every single one of you has a role to play in that. If you're not here on Sunday, all the rest of us suffer and miss out because of the specific gifts that you have. If you decide, I'm going to be here four times a year, then think of all the times that the rest of us miss out on you and the specific abilities and gifts that you have. You're important. And you're important because God has put you here. And God has put you here because he has specific things that he'd like to accomplish with you and through you. May we understand that this is the gracious, loving God who lives for us, dies for us, forgives us, and commissions us and sends us out. He has not given you anything quite so terrifying as he gave to Moses. He has not sent you to speak to a foreign king and ruler, asking him to set people free from slavery. He doesn't ask you to do that. He asks you to do smaller, more manageable things. May we understand that God is good, that he sends us out, and that he will be with us. And with that confidence, we can go. Amen. Our worship continues as we join in our confession of faith, as we use the words of, I believe it's the Nicene Creed. Haha, I got it right. The Nicene Creed, which you'll find on page one, pages 162 and 163 in the blue hymnal, the words are also on the, on the screen. Please stand as we join in confessing our faith together. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, 
begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated. We continue with our prayer of the church. Almighty God and Father, we thank you for all your mercies, especially for the gift of your Son, through whom you have revealed your gracious will. We praise you for the Holy Spirit and his working through the means of grace. Strengthen and defend your church, that by your word and sacraments, faith may grow and love toward all may increase. Keep our children in the grace of their baptisms. Enable their parents to train them in lives of faith. Preserve our nation in justice and honor. Guide and bless all who make, administer, and judge our laws. Let your blessing rest on planting and harvest, commerce and industry, medicine and science, the arts and culture. Protect all who travel and care for those whose work is difficult or dangerous. Comfort all who are in sorrow or need, sickness or adversity. Remember those who suffer persecution for the faith. Have mercy on those for whom death draws near. Hear us, Lord, as we pray in silence. We remember with thanksgiving those who have loved and serve you who now rest from their labors. Console those who are mourning or living with sadness. Grant us these things, Father, for the sake of Jesus, who died and rose again. Amen. Our worship continues on page 165 in the Blue Hymnal. Please stand. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who promised that wherever two or three come together in his name, there he is with them, to shepherd his flock until he comes again in glory. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their glorious song.
We give thanks to you, O God, through your dear Son, Jesus Christ, whom you sent to be our Savior, our Redeemer, and the messenger of your grace. Through him you made all things, in him you are well pleased. He is the incarnate Word, conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. To fulfill your promises, he stretched out his hands on the cross and released from eternal death all who believe in you. As we remember Jesus' death and resurrection, we thank you that you have gathered us together to receive your Son's body and blood. Send us your Spirit, unite us as one, and strengthen our faith so that we may praise you in your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him we glorify and honor you, O God our Father, with the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Please stand. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. Whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, we give thanks, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us with this saving gift. We pray that through it you will strengthen our faith in you and increase our love for one another. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. You may be seated for our closing hymn.
Once again, good morning, everyone. So nice to see all of you here. This is, um, as I said, the first in a three-week series looking at God's calling different people into the ministry. So next week, we'll get to hear about... I forget. Well, come back, and you'll hear about it then, okay? Uh, Just a couple of announcements today. One of them is, you may note the bulletin is a little bit longer than it typically is. Um, We figured out a new way to format it so we didn't have to cut individual little sheets. It's a little bit quicker for us to put together, but it also enables us to include more information in here. So if you haven't looked through it yet, uh, just check it out. There might be something that that, uh, you find interesting. We do have Bible study following worship today at about 10.30, 10.35, 10.40, whenever I can reach critical mass here in the sanctuary. But we're starting a brand new Bible study. We're going to be looking at the Augsburg Confession, which is a Lutheran statement of faith that is turning 493 years old this year. And we're going to have a service to commemorate the day because its birthday is June 25th, which Sunday falls on in just two weeks. So if you'd like more information on that, or you'd like to find out what in the world that is in the first place, meet back here in the sanctuary at about a half hour from now. In the meantime, I'll greet you at the door. There's coffee and things to eat over there. And um, all the other announcements are either on the bulletin or on the screen. uh, Last, last thing, if you're part of men's morning ministry and you need more guidance on the little event today, please talk to Steve Groth. All right, that's all I got. God's blessings on the rest of your Sunday.